Good evening, everyone, and uh, Chairman Galloway, and members of the board. I am a new member of the Albuquerque Police Department. I came on board in April of this year, retiring from another city and coming here, but I'm a Deputy Chief over Administrative Support. Specifically for tonight, uh, Chief Guyer asked me to come and provide an update to you on some of the efforts uh, by APD related to our overtime expenditures. So that's my purpose here, and I'm pleased to be here to, uh, to speak to you. Uh, we've been doing a thorough review of all of our overtime spending, Chief's overtime, and then all of the more traditional budgetary overtime expenditures. And we've come up with quite a few recommendations that we're about to put into place. Uh, obviously, it's a pretty in-depth, complicated topic, so I'll just try to hit the high notes and then obviously answer any questions that you may have. Uh, but primarily, we are changing the approval processes for overtime spending within each area command. So we're increasing the level of authority required for overtime. So uh, area commanders are going to be approving it. Bureau deputy chiefs are going to be approving certain types of overtime just to provide some additional oversight and accountability for that. We're going to be, and this is a, a fairly large uh, effort for APD, we're going to be eliminating training overtime which for us is a, a fairly large percentage of our overtime spending, just through better scheduling, through appropriate shift adjustments, and that's going to be able to save us a tremendous amount of money there. We're going to be better managing comp time uh, and those payouts when comp time maximums are reached. That's going to be a pretty significant effort and some, some significant savings, I do believe. We're going to be strengthening the Chief's overtime policies to address previous policy inadequacies that have been identified. Uh, commanders are going to be provided a lot of additional information. We have found honestly that we weren't providing them with adequate information to make these management decisions as they lead their men and women in these area commands. So we've created a dashboard that will provide some real-time bi-weekly information to them to allow them just to make more real-time management decisions as these overtime expenditures take place versus a quarterly update or a uh, uh, either a biannual or annual update. So that's just not enough time for us to have made corrections. There's an upcoming shift bid that'll take place or start at the end of this month. Uh, and that is gonna significantly provide some better shift overlap as far as when shifts start and when shifts end. That in and of itself will reduce shift holdovers during the busy times that uh, different area commands have. It'll also allow us to do some training, the shorter segments of training during some of that overlap time to again, not have us to pay officers for separate, uh, separate training times. And it will also help us with our supervisor officer ratios. So that's going to come on board at the end of this month, and we're excited to see what that might produce for us. And then we all are aware of the tremendous number of special events that occur in the city, and obviously some are very large in scale. Uh, so we've already implemented this model with some of the smaller events, but uh, we're utilizing DMD security. We're, we're utilizing transit security in conjunction with APD to cut some of the overtime for that as well. And we're also utilizing our PSAs and some better scheduling for some of the non-essential, maybe those early posts where a road needs to be blocked or some other important but not critical functions need to happen. So we're going to be uh, doing that and that'll save officer overtime. We're also just taking a little more critical look at the staggering the start times for some of these very long events like Freedom Fourth and some of the other events that are long in duration just to better bring in officers when we need them more. And we're adjusting the hours for some of our specialty teams like open space to where they will be covering some of these events during regular work shifts. Many of these events obviously occur on the weekend. So other schedule adjustments are also being utilized as feasible and we modeled that and we started that. I was over the preparation for the APD for senior games and we were able to adjust some scheduling there and had practically no overtime expenditures for that event in the city, which was significant, not necessarily in the crowds, but in the number of venues. There were a lot of venues there and a lot of events covering a lot of uh, the activities that were going on for senior games. Uh, so I honestly believe that once we're able to fine-tune those processes, then we'll be able to switch and look at other aspects of the overtime spending within APD and find some savings there. But we're excited and uh, hopeful for those opportunities. So I'm um, open to any questions that you might have. 
Um, implementation timeline would be when? Well, we uh, plan to have a special order in place by the shift bid, which is the end of the month. And we're just doing that so we won't lose the, the, the time that just naturally occurs with uh, policy changes. So we're going to have a uh, special order in place by the end of the month that will codify these changes. Uh, officially, there's about 17 different, it really gets into the minutia of some of this, and there's a decision-making matrix for the commanders. Uh, so we'll have that in place by the end of the month, and then uh, rapidly move toward a full traditional SOP adjustments to codify these changes permanently in policy. And my second question has to do with when do you measure the success? Is it a, do you have to wait a year? Oh, no, ma'am. Uh, part of the dashboard that? that I mentioned right. is going to be bi-weekly. So every payroll cycle, commanders, and all of us, all the executive staff and commanders themselves will be getting these updates as we go. And then within fiscal affairs, which is one of the units that I have, we've obviously implemented some processes to take uh, real-time snapshots every two weeks to see, compare ourselves to the last average for the last three years to see how we're trending up and down. Each commander will get a list each payroll period of their top ten overtime uh, users, what types of overtime are being used. I'm not saying all overtime is bad, it's not, but we want to just ensure that we're addressing any negative trend perhaps or we're able to move resources if that were appropriate for an area command that might be having some additional challenges. So it will be bi-weekly for all of us within the department. I'm thinking that coming back to the board here for a report on that, when do you think would be a reasonable measure of time, say January? or Yes, ma'am. I honestly be? hope we'll see some trending, good or bad, uh, by January. I feel comfortable there. I'm, I'm very hopeful uh, related to that because even a minor reduction in overtime translates into some pretty significant dollars. Each 10% of reduction in overtime is $1.8 million. Uh, based on last year's spending. So I do believe I'd be able to give you at least an initial snapshot in uh, in January of our progress. And is there a summary of your remarks here that we could study? Uh, you went through that really quickly, so I, I'd well, like to Well, and I can appreciate more. that. I didn't, this is my first appearance in front of you, so I was a little uncertain as to the depth that uh, would be needed of me. I didn't want to abuse your time. No. Uh, so I don't have anything for tonight, but I most assuredly could produce something very rapidly to give you that would provide a little more in-depth information to you. Perhaps you could share it with Mr. Harness. And, I'd be happy to do that. And uh, do it that I way. Also have access to power dms so they'll be able to see the special rating. okay but yes i'll produce that uh, for a shorter term ability for uh you to assess and review and then we've had I some questions about it because we made suggestions to that end and so we've had some questions of us uh, I can appreciate about that, that so it would be helpful to be able to share your plan of action yes ma'am i will uh i will produce that in a manner that I think, like I said, some of the work that we've done is really into the into the weeds, and I'll try to pull it back a little bit, but still give you a good the bit The 10,000-foot view would be Yes, great. ma'am. Maybe 5,000, just so you can get the flavor of what's happening, but uh, uh, I, will, uh, I will make that a priority. Uh, thank you very much. I You're very welcome. It. Any other questions for me? Yes. Could you comment a little more on what kinds of changes you're looking at with the uh, Chief's Overtime Program? I can to some degree. I know that uh, for CPC 275.18, there were some potential SOP violations that came up in the midst of that investigation, and they are being addressed in this as well. And it's going to cover the fact that uh, an officer cannot sign up for or accept any overtime assignment while they are on an on-call status. So that'll be corrected with that special order. Uh, and then officers can sometimes switch off their on-call uh, and if an officer does that, uh, they cannot transfer overtime to that person and any time that might come from the additional coverage, like my friend is going to cover me for a particular time, if there's some compensatory time earned by that other person, it doesn't transfer to the other, to the new individual. So that is one thing that has been um, addressed. And then also related to just investigating complaints for officers' behavior related to being on any type of overtime assignment. If there's a supervisor that is assigned to that detail, which some are just based on the number of officers, then that supervisor working that detail would be in charge of that investigation. If because it's a smaller event requiring fewer officers, there is not a supervisor, then the officer that is complained upon 
uh, their direct everyday supervisor will be tasked with conducting that investigation and, and will be responsible for its uh, completion, be that through internal affairs. But they'll, they'll have ownership of that case to speak with the complainant, make sure we understand what route it needs to take within APD. So that's two things that came about from that investigation that will just tighten up what were uh, some, I guess it would be fair to say, policy inadequacies that were ambiguous related to that. So we're, we're tightening that up as a part of this process as well. That's not really monetarily driven. That's just obviously policy driven and appropriate oversight. And from the fiscal side, are, are we certain that the amount that businesses or, or groups or, or whoever is chartering this uh, chief's overtime, are we certain that that amount is covering the full cost of the officer's time benefits and the cost to the city? I honestly would not feel prepared to answer that. We've certainly had internal discussions related to that. Honestly, for this effort and the information that I'll provide for you, we have really hyper-focused on administrative training, community meeting, and special event overtime, just as some of the lower-hanging fruit that we could address and have an impact on quicker. Because obviously our goal is not to impact our operational ability to fight crime and be engaged with the community. So we're focusing on that first, hope to have it success, and then I think we'll dig deeper. But right now, to be 100% accurate, I wouldn't feel comfortable to tell you that we are completely satisfied that Chief's overtime rates do meet all of that criteria that you just mentioned. Thank you. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Okay, um, so you said a better, okay, first you said the, this is a list of recommendations. Is that a list of SOP recommendations, a list of special order recommendations? Well, it's a little above. We're going to start with the special order just for speed, just so we can get it implemented at the time of the shift bid, because some of the ramifications of the shift bid with the shift overlaps will allow us to do things that we cannot do now uh, based on our current scheduling. So we're just going to time it with the shift bid because of the staffing benefits that we're going to achieve with some of those changes in, in particular area commands. Uh, those things give us, I call them power days where there's more people working on certain days that would allow us to have people go to training not use overtime and still maintain high staffing levels. That's just a small example. But just because of the policy review process and policy implementation and change process is a bit longer, we didn't want to lose time. We've been putting a lot of effort. It's been my number one priority since coming aboard April 1st is this effort uh, from the chief. Uh, so we're just starting with the special order, but the special order will be codified into the appropriate SOPs. Okay, so how many of these, if you're able to answer this question, if not, that's okay. But how many of these are special order recommendations and how many of these are SOP recommendations? Well, the, the, I try it, to it, take it, notes as rapidly as possible. So out of this list, what am I looking it's at? It's going to be all, all the things that I described are going to be codified in the special order and then codified appropriately into oh, an so SOP. Oh, so one special order that's sort of like an omnibus yes, of all the... Okay. Yes, ma'am, because... Like the chief's overtime is not really an overtime savings. It was just an inadequacy correction. Uh, some of these things are just overt attempts to reduce the, the spending by either changing the approvals or changing the manner in which we're conducting our training. Some of that will impact how our training staff is scheduled just to, uh, we routinely have officers train on days off not purposefully, but that just ultimately ends up happening. We're trying to correct that for better quality of life balance for officers and also to save taxpayer money related to the overtime. Okay. Um, and so you said that that's going to, the special order then should roll out at the upcoming shift bid that will start later this month? Yes, ma'am, at the end of this month. Okay. So we should anticipate seeing this big special order soon yes ma'am okay cool yes um, ma'am i'm awaiting final approval from uh miss nair and then we're we're prepared to move forward okay great um so um i know at least in the emails i was reading to prepare for tonight i remembered and also our recommendations letter um a discussion of a cap on overtime i don't believe you mentioned that i did not uh but we are prepared a part of these recommendations is we are going to cap the total number of hours that an officer can work in a week at 65 with the exception of court because court is obviously kind of a separate animal that we have 
practically no control over when cases come through the docket and when those subpoenas are issued. So an officer will work their traditional 40-hour work week, and then there's going to be a cap of 25 hours additional on all overtime of any kind to include chief's overtime. So that could be overtime on a call if you were a SWAT member or you responded to a homicide or some other criminal event. Uh, it could be a combination of that and chief's overtime. It could be grant overtime. So be, um, we're carving out court overtime because of our lack of control. We do not control that docket. But within the time that we control, there's be, there will be a cap of 65 hours total, total, total time. And we're doing that for some of the issues I've talked about about overtime, but also to uh, work toward a better work-life balance for the men and women that work for the police department and try to help them as well as well as some of the other health and wellness initiatives that are going on. We felt like that was a critical part of it as well. Okay. Now, what about um, this dashboard you mentioned? Will it alert... Uh supervisors or the command if a person is routinely let's say every week maxing out that 25 hours if it's just As it's a, designed if it's right just this a second, behavior? i don't think it has that capability because this has been wholly created for this initiative so we are crawling with the hopes of walking and running related to our ability to have more of an intervention type perspective as well which i think is the perhaps the path that you're looking at but for each week or each payroll period of two weeks, there will be the top 10 overtime users for that area command. The type of overtime that was earned is also going to be on there because obviously these commanders know these men and women. They know mm -hmm. their work assignments. They know maybe what, have been, what was driving the fact that they're on the top 10 list. Because you're on that list is not necessarily bad. It'll just be a, a refresher or a, a, a prompt for that commander to assess. And obviously the expectation would be if there is an officer that is perpetually on there, and let's just say it's a 40-hour work week and 25 hours of chief's overtime week after week after week, Week, it would be our hope that that commander would have a uh, have a discussion, have his staff speak to that person related to that work-life balance that we're describing. Uh, that's not the system we hope will generate more alerts in the future, as it stood right this second. And all candor, I would tell you, it would not do that, not because we don't want to, but because we are still developing it. Okay, um, so this is really useful. Thank you for coming down here to explain it to us. I'm wondering, so in the um, investigation the CPOA did, um, there were numerous recommendations. You've addressed numerous things tonight. Um, it's kind of a lot to hold all in mind. It is um, for me as well. <laughs> and I'm wondering, I mean, I'm wondering if it's possible to get, and I mean, I think uh, Vice Chair Fine kind of hinted at something like this, but I'm wondering if it's possible to get some sort of of maybe after the special order rolls out some sort of memoranda memorandum that covers uh, the recommendations that the um, that Chief Geyer mentioned he was planning to address in his response to our investigation. That way we could have, you know, more details and uh, consider it, deliberate a little bit uh, more um, scrupulously than just a oral conversation would something like that be possible well i believe so i honestly think the special <coughs> order even though it will be long i can tell you it is it, it is not an easy thing to codify in in writing all of these changes and the different ways that we operate so the special order itself is going to be very voluminous i can tell you uh so I guess we I'm could telling start you, I'm certainly there. willing to. I'm just there. trying to think through in a way to honor the request that you're giving versus the fact that we're working through the order. So I well, think the order we may start initially with the special it. order, and yes. then if there are any, you know, outstanding questions or anything left hanging, then we could come back and have another conversation. I'd be happy to try to fill in anything that the special order left because some of it does get into the minutia of our operational aspects that it's kind of boring, but we okay. had to codify in the special order. So yes, ma'am, I'd be happy to do Thank that. Thank you. And then the very last piece is that we're not on a distribution list for special orders. So if you could make it a point to um, send it to our executive director so that we would get that. We get a lot, like the policies, but we don't necessarily get all the special orders that roll out from what I've been able to ascertain. Uh, Chair Galloway, member of Vandeventer, the special orders are available to the board through Power DMS. Right, but we don't get any notification as to when they're published, so. We just need to I'd be happy to <laughs> let you know when that special order is, is published. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Cass. Um, 
is this a, how many how much of the overtime policy currently is covered by special order versus SOP? Uh, I'm just curious if there's going to be a movement toward taking this from the special order uh, sphere to uh, have it more codify, codified in the in SOPs, is or is that a is there any thoughts along those lines? I mean, you're going to develop SOPs as a result of the special order. Um, is that going to be a move increase in in the SOPs that are now covering overtime? I don't think it's not going to be an increase in the number of SOPs. We're obviously going to fine tune them. I don't know the number of previous SOP, excuse me, special orders that might have addressed overtime. Just simply because I'm new to the agency, I'm aware of some that have come and been rescinded, and some that are still in place. So I don't know the number. Uh, the, the only, I can tell you, the use of the special order in this instance is just for speed. We want to implement these as rapidly as we can. We've been analyzing it since April, uh, and we want to implement it. But then our goal, and I know Chief Geyer's goal, is to codify it hard into SOP. So I, I think SOPs are just a way for us to be a little more fluid and able to move quicker because obviously the policy process in general needs to be more thoughtful and deliberate and then obviously for CASA compliance and, and, and monitor approval, it just tends to slow things down and we didn't want to lose time since time is literally money with this particular topic, time is money and we're wanting to push these changes down. So is it fair to say that most of the overtime policy is currently covered by special orders? I don't believe, I, I just don't feel equipped to, to answer that and because I want to be 100% accurate with every word that comes out of my mouth to you. So I just right. don't feel equipped to do that. Uh, I can tell you moving forward, we want to codify it in SOP. Okay, thank you. Do you have a timeline for that? Because it seems like this could be one of those things that might, well, I, that's when the special order is going to be done, but when it's going to be codified as an SOP. Well, unfortunately, I'm going to be the weak link related to how long the policy process takes here at APD because this will be my first one to shepherd through or be the executive sponsor. So I, I'm not trying to not answer you, but this will be my first, so I do not have the history of how long previous policies have taken. So I hate to tell you I can't answer it, but it's not because I don't want to answer it. Is that because of the process going through OPA PPRB? Yes, ma'am. Okay. When Do you have an idea of when you might expect yourself to be ready and your department to be ready to present that to OPA? Like the piece that you can control? Early September. Okay. Simply because once the special order is in place, the content of that special order is going to be my presentation to everyone related to any policy review. Wonderful. Uh, we might obviously change the formatting, but the wording won't change. Sure. Uh, it'll just be a format change because some of this does touch more than one SOP potentially. Uh, so we either take something out of an SOP and codify it all into one. Those are just internal decisions. But uh, my personal mandate would be early September because uh, I can tell you I have no higher priority than this particular topic. Thank you. Anybody this, else? This has been most helpful. Thank you so well, much for you. being here. Yeah, I, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.